Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. I'm a rheumatologist with 15 years experience bringing you information you need about all things rheumatology so that you can make the best health decisions for you. Today we are talking about a condition you don't often find much information about on the interwebs, and that's Bichette's disease. Well, we are going to get into all the details here, so stick around. What is Bichette's? Bichette's is a systemic, meaning it affects the entire body or system, vasculitis. This means that at its core, it's a condition of blood vessel inflammation. The blood vessels can be veins or arteries, big or small. Vasculitis is an umbrella diagnosis that include all different types of conditions and Bichette's is just one of them. Bichette's is particularly interesting in that a little geography and history knowledge is helpful when figuring out if someone has it. Bichette's prevalence is highest in those living or historically from the area known as the Silk Road. The Silk Road isn't actually a road, but instead a web of routes used for trade from the 100s BCE to 1400 CE. These routes ran from China to Europe, extending about 4,000 miles. Items that were transported were, of course, silk, but also jade, porcelain, tea, spices, horses, and glassware. Along with these tangible goods, this path was our first step in globalization, as ideas, information, and innovation, and even infection, were also traded along this route. Even if you've never heard of the Silk Road, you've probably heard of one of its most famous travelers, Marco Polo. And yes, Bichette's is named after someone. Who Lucy Bichette first published his findings of what he called a triple symptom complex of oral or genital ulcers, eye inflammation, and skin lesions in 1936. And then it was formally recognized as a thing in 1947. Although Bichette's can be seen in anyone to this day, it is much more likely in those either along the Silk Road or ethnically related to this region. Bichette's is a condition of youth to midlife, meaning the vast majority of those diagnosed are between 15 and 45 years old. Although seen both in men and women equally, when men get it, they tend to have it worse. So why do some people get Bichette's? Unfortunately, like most of my autoimmune conditions, I don't have a satisfying answer. The general idea right now is that a predisposed person is exposed to certain triggers that then kickstarts this inflammatory cascade that leads to Bichette's. So what are the possible triggers? Well, exposure to infections, histamine releasing foods such as citrus, nuts, and cheese, poor oral hygiene, and stress have all been implicated. But any particular person's triggers may be different than someone else's. Like many other autoimmune conditions, there is growing evidence of abnormalities in the gut and even salivary microbiome that could be a contributing factor, but specifics on this are lacking. There is no specific blood test to diagnose Bichette's, but there is a genetic marker, the HLA B51. But a word of warning. Like other genetic markers we have found associated with autoimmune disorders, the presence of this marker doesn't nail down a diagnosis. Most people with Bichette's will have this marker, but there are many more people in the world with this marker who won't have Bichette's. So like every other autoimmune condition I talk about here, the diagnosis is made based on a collection of things. Most importantly will be your symptoms. All right then what are the symptoms? Similar to other systemic autoimmune conditions we've discussed, like lupus, Bichette's can affect different body parts. Keep in mind that not everyone will have every symptom listed, and the symptoms you can experience can change over time. We're going to start with the most common and work our way down to the rare. The hallmark symptom of Bichette's is oral ulcers. Mouth ulcers are considered the most common and most persistent of all the symptoms. Already you may see how it can be tricky to diagnose as oral ulcers are just plain common. Most people with Bichette's will have mouth ulcers, but most definitely most people with mouth ulcers will not have Bichette's. Other skin or mucosal symptoms include genital ulcers, usually found on the scrotum or labia, 
acne-like skin rashes, or nodular skin lesions. The genital ulcers of Bichette's can be particularly cumbersome, as these are usually angrier ulcers than what we get in our mouth and can leave scarring. About one third of all Bichette's patients will only have these skin or mucosal issues. The next symptom we see in about 50% of Bichette's patients are eye issues, specifically eye inflammation. Now we think of the eye as being the most common major organ that is involved with Bichette's, which generally drives me crazy because um, I happen to think that the skin and joints, which we're gonna talk about next, are major organs, but I'm biased, so whatever. Anyways, so our eye has lots of different compartments and structures within it. Inflammation in certain structures and in certain patterns can be seen in Bichette's, and often our eye doctor will be the first one to mention the possibility of Bichette's. Next, we have joint symptoms. Joint pain and or inflammation will happen in about half of all Bichette's patients and will usually go after the knees, ankles, wrists, or elbows. The joint pain could be just that, pain or it could be associated with joint inflammation and swelling like what we would see with rheumatoid arthritis. It is also not uncommon to see inflammation around the joint affecting our ligaments and tendons. This is a phenomenon we call enthesitis. Thankfully, as opposed to RA, we don't see joint destruction as a result of the joint inflammation in Bichette's. The next symptoms are thankfully more rare, although they can also be more serious. Remember, Bichette's is a vasculitis, meaning it's due to inflammation of our blood vessels. This can lead to clots and aneurysms of certain vessels of our legs, our liver, or around our heart. We can also see inflammation in different areas of our brain that lead to headaches, weakness, or seizures. This is often also going to be associated with particular types of eye disease related to Bichette's. And finally, we have gut issues. These are much more commonly seen in those of East Asian descent and can result in ulcers along the entire digestive tract, which can be confused with inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. So what do we do about Bichette's? How do we treat it once we have made a diagnosis? The approach to anyone with Bichette's is going to be very personalized to any particular person's collection of symptoms and it may require a multidisciplinary approach. This simply means you likely will need a team of providers. This could include your rheumatologist, ophthalmologist, and maybe even a dermatologist or neurologist. The goal of treatment is to get control of the inflammation as quickly as possible to prevent relapses and any irreversible organ damage. Remember, healed inflammation can leave a scar. If an organ has suffered enough inflammation and left enough scarring, that organ may now not function at 100%. So we try to get ahead of this. Now this is obviously an oversimplification and each condition and organ has a different risk of this happening, but generally, this is our approach and strategy with most autoimmune conditions. We wanna stop the inflammation now to prevent all the downstream problems that inflammation and scarring can cause. So how do we know when treatment is working? Again, this is going to be very personal. We follow your symptoms, obviously, but also your CRP levels, your C-reactive protein levels. CRP are simply blood inflammatory markers. We may even follow your imaging, like x-rays, CT scans, or MRIs. So what are the medications we use? Well, the first medicine anyone with Bichette's will usually be on is colchicine. It's an old but tried and true anti-inflammatory. This medication is often associated with gout, but it's the go-to in Bichette's as well. It's especially effective in those whose main issue is skin, mucosal, or joint inflammation. Colchicine can be used along with topical steroids, which come in lots of different varieties. You can take mouthwashes, skin creams, or even joint injections. And this combination of colchicine and topical steroids can be enough to get someone's condition under control. If colchicine doesn't work or someone can't take it, another option is a primalast or the brand name Otesla. This is a small molecule medication that works to dampen the inflammatory response via modulating the immune system and was originally approved for use with things like psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Stronger immune system targeted medications like oral or IV steroids or even biologic medications 
are usually reserved for those with more serious symptoms and can require your team of doctors to come together to agree on a plan. There's still a lot to learn about Bichette's and the journey to a diagnosis can be long and frustrating and requires a high level of suspicion. This is why I like to get y'all some food for thought and questions to ask yourself and take with you to your doctor's appointments to continue this conversation, hopefully get you some answers and feeling confident about your care plan. So number one, have you been seeing an eye doctor for eye inflammation? Has it been a one and done situation, which sometimes happens with eye inflammation, or does the inflammation keep coming back? If it keeps coming back, ask your eye doctor or your primary care doctor, could this be due to some underlying issue? Now, eye inflammation can be related to lots of different things, not just Bichette's. But if you keep having flares and you haven't found a reason, it's a good time to ask. Secondly, have you been working with your gynecologist or your primary care doctor regarding some genital ulcers? This can be a particularly sensitive or embarrassing issues, but we can't pretend it's not there. Oftentimes, the gynecologist may be the first person to mention Bichette's. Is your family from the area of the world along the Silk Road? If the doctor doesn't bring it up, bring up the possibility of Bichette's at your next visit. Or you can even ask their opinion about it via a portal message. And finally, if you've already been diagnosed with Bichette's, the key will be about keeping track of your symptoms. Keeping a symptom diary, even a loose weekly one, can really help everyone on your team understand if things are going the right direction. All right, folks, that's what I've got on Bichette's. I know I didn't really get into many lifestyle changes you can make that can be helpful, which I usually love to do. That's honestly because we just aren't there yet. It certainly can't hurt to implement some good habits like incorporating more anti-inflammatory foods while reducing things like fast food or making sure you get some good quality sleep but I can't necessarily provide any guarantees those things will make a substantial impact on your disease or your need for medication, at least not right now. I hope this helped if you liked it. It really helps us out if you like and subscribe. Share this with anyone you think could use this information and we'll see you next time.